Yesterday was Durban July, and Julius Malema, the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters, was attending the event. He posted a picture of himself and his wife attending the event. Then the people who know these things, the people who make it their business to know these things, me, I don't know these things, but some people know these things and they know them quite well. The people said, Hey, what's that shoe shoe that you're wearing? It's a red bottom shoe. And apparently that shoe costs 30,000 rands or close to 30,000 rands. And obviously there's a conversation now about the authenticity of Julius Malema, the EFF, and whether or not it's justified for him to wear this, if he's a fake, if he's a fugazi, all of that. Now, At the back of that, I think there's somewhat of a serious discussion. So I want to start off with the serious discussion before I talk about some of this shoe policing that happens all the time. You know, I don't know what shoe Helen Ziller wears, what shoe Sir Ramaphosa wears, because the media never tells me. I always know the shoes of Floyd Shivambu, Judas Malema. I know every footwear that they've worn because... The media is always telling me, they're like, hey, man, this is what these people are wearing. These, This is where they buy their underwear. This is where they buy their jeans. This is where they buy their shoes. I'm like, thank you, but, you know, what about everybody else? Like, if you're going to tell me, tell me about everybody. I think that the media sometimes is 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 not genuine in those conversations. But I think also some of the people who lead these conversations are not genuine. But let's put that aside for now. Let's Let's have a conversation. Three questions that I think are germane to this topic that require some consideration. Number one, should public representatives be modest in lifestyle? Number two, what is meaningful representation? Number three, are the questions around the EFF and their dress code genuine or malicious? Let's start with the first question. Should public representatives be modest in lifestyle? I think In general, the answer to this question is yes. Why do I say so? I think that when you lead a country with high inequalities, with high levels of poverty, when you flash opulence in front of them, sometimes it can be tasteless and sometimes it can be insensitive. And sometimes it can even be cruel because those people are looking at you enjoying living your best life and they have nothing, or they have close to nothing. So I think sometimes when you see people who are supposed to represent you, to stand for you, to care about you, wearing wearing affluent clothing, participating in lavish events, living lavish lifestyles, it almost feels as if you, the voter, are just being used, and that it's not about you at all, but that, you know, you just support these entities so that they can become some version of, you know, the big church pastor who's trying to scam everyone and get a jet, etc. You know, the big pastors who say, I need this uh, G, G, G600 or whatever it's called so that I can fly to Africa and convert Africans. And then, like, Africa's been converted, <laughs> For a while now, you know, I think 90% of Africa is Christian. Like, where are these ministers flying to? They're taking all of this money to come and convert Africans. We have our own men of God here who are busy, like, doing Bushiri things. Anyway, the point that I'm making is when there is poverty, when there is pain, I think public representatives should try to be modest in how they engage the public. This is not a political party point. This is across the board. And I think it applies to any country, you know, whether it's America or France or Britain or Togo, whatever the case may be. I think that in instances where you have economic difficulties, there needs to be modesty. At the same time, I do understand that, you know, politicians are human beings too. They have aspirations, they have fashion tastes, they also want to swank, et cetera, et cetera. It's only Titomboweni who doesn't want to, um, you know, swank. Let's go to the second question. What is meaningful representation? This, I think, is the real question at the heart of everything. 
you know, I was joking about Tito Mboweni earlier, and sometimes he likes to dress in the poor man aesthetic. But he owns farms, he works at Goldman Sachs, and um, he's got shares in multiple companies. And the economic preferences and policies, policies that he has chosen have been very adverse to poor people in general. So you have Tito Mboweni making his fish at night, you know, boiling his chicken and all of that stuff, you know, cosplaying poverty when he is one of the richest men in South Africa and one of the most influential men in finance in South Africa. Then you've got, obviously, the Reserve Bank governor, who's he doesn't play that game. He comes there, Baba, he's, you know, to the nines, you know, suit and tie, inflation must fall. He's genuine, right? So is it meaningful representation to have someone like Tito Mboweni say, I'm a revolutionary, I care about the poor, but then his policies don't necessarily line up with that or his actions. You know, before he got the job back to be um to be minister, he was tweeting very radical things and you know, you know, playing to the gallery because social media can be very left leaning, particularly Twitter. But when he got the job, he didn't do any of those things. And in fact, he walked away from many of the ideas that he seemed to stand for prior. Meaningful representation. When I often hear, you know, that there's a, for instance, when they said Rishi Sunak is now the first prime minister of the UK, Indian prime minister of the UK. I was happy at a symbolic level. I was like, this is good. Progressive UK. But at a deeper level, I was like, but what does he stand for? What does he stand for? Because am I happy that an Indian man got the job if his politics are Afrophobic? And he was very Afrophobic in his policies, you know. The the UK has got this very anti-immigrant stance where they're like, we don't want people coming here on boats. And I'm always amused when I hear them speak about that vehemently because you went around the world on boats and took stuff from people and took people from people. The whole UK business model was based on boats landing on other people's shores. You arrogant, pompous British people. What's wrong with you? Come on, man. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that just because you have a particular skin tone or you are from a particular group doesn't mean that you are representative of that group in the real sense. Meaningful representation is about advocacy of issues that affect that group. It is about actions uh, of uh, in, in line with issues that affect that group. Now, the EFF, when the COVID-19 relief fund was set up by President Ramaphosa, they contributed a lot of money to that fund. And actually, they forced members of their own party to contribute to that fund because that fund was supposed to help the poor. Is that an action that counts? The EFF built houses for grandmothers, big houses, and they gave them keys. And now those grandmothers live with dignity. Is that an action that counts? The EFF took some pilots, pilot aviation students to aviation school. Then those kids became pilots. Three examples which I think indicate that Maybe the fact that Julius Malema wears these shoes with teeth at the back may not be that big of a thing. I don't know. I don't know. But when you go to their manifesto, their manifesto is one of the things that speaks to who you really are, what you stand for as a political entity. Their manifesto is driven by Marxism, by Leninism. And one of the things that they've advocated for is for 24-hour open clinics. They've advocated for the insourcing of workers, you know, cleaners, security guards, etc. Because those were taken to labor brokers and labor brokers were not giving them permanent contracts. And they were getting, you know, ripped off in terms of how much they were earning, in terms of worker protections. The EFF advocated and fought for that. So is that not meaningful representation? Whether they are wearing Gucci or Prada or whatever that shoe is called. Isn't that meaningful representation? Meaningful representation is not about skin tone. It's about action. It's about empathy. 
and it's about contribution. I think that when we measure that, that's what we've got to measure. That's what we've got to assess. Now, obviously, there are some who say, no, they're just pretending. Why are they wearing this stuff to parliament, these overalls, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there is value to letting people know as well that you are on their team when you are in places like parliament. There is value to that. Okay, if you're going to, um, you know, Durban, July, yeah, fine. There's a there's a dress code there. It's a flamboyant dress code. It's a flamboyant aesthetic. I wouldn't go to Durban, July. I don't have no Durban, July money. <laughs> I, you know how long it took me to get this podcast microphone? It took too long. Too long. <laughs> too long. Yeah, it took me a long time to get this microphone. So I definitely cannot go to no Durban, July you know, in some shoes which are fancy. But at the same time, people go to Durban July, you know. A uh, leader of opposition, uh, not a leader of opposition, a senior um, member of parliament who is a leader of a party gets paid, I think, slightly more than an ordinary MP. And, you know, his wife works as well. She, I think she works in corporate South Africa. She is well remunerated as well. I don't know how the EFF remuneration dynamics works, but I think he can afford those shoes and I think he can afford to go to these events. The real question should be, what are these people advocating for? What are the people standing up for? So the last thing I wanted to discuss is this question of, is it genuine or malicious? I think for some people who ask questions around the EFF, they are concerned about the corruption allegations, VBS, and you know those other allegations around construction of bridges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in in Cape in what am I saying? In Limpopo, allegations of corruption that have followed Julius Malema for a very long time, and they are concerned that hey, this person being flamboyant and all of this, can he afford this lifestyle? Is this money legitimately acquired? I think there is a group of people that do that. But I think there's another group of people who are not genuinely concerned, who are maliciously asking these questions because they don't ask these questions to anybody else. They don't ask ANC leaders whether or not they can represent the poor whilst wearing Gucci, Prada and all of those things. Have you ever seen ANC guys when they are at Konka, et cetera, et cetera? I've never been, but I was watching like, G and I heard that a lot of these guys are up in there, you know, <laughs> living their best life with the blessers. I think it's safe to say over 60% of blessers, sorry, of the blessed, <laughs> the blessed amongst us who slay amongst us, uh, in cahoots, in, in romantic cahoots with comrades of, of various ilk. I think we've seen enough now to know that when you see a very blessed person, uh, you know, un unveiling cars and all kinds of mansions and all kinds of housing and stuff like that, you better know that there's a cater somewhere. but. I find that they they get a pass. You know, the, the Democratic Alliance speaks about how they want to uh, represent the poor and help the poor as well. Everybody wants to help the poor in politics. But a lot of their policies are anti-poor. Nobody asks them questions about that. Nobody asks these people about the mansions that they live in, et cetera, et cetera, because people don't, don't um, indulge in luxury the same way. Some people who indulge in luxury, they won't buy like um, a G-Wagon. But they'll buy some expensive Fortuna Toyota with all of the perks that costs a lot of money. And just because that thing is ugly doesn't mean it's cheap. A lot of these people have got like family farms and family homes. We never hear about the wealth of the Steinhazen family, for instance. I didn't even know his father owned a farm up until now. When he was asked what his experience is in agriculture, that he said, my father was a farmer. I don't know whether that's experience. You know, <laughs> your father can be a doctor, but we don't go let you do surgery because there's a few steps required. But that's the story for another day. Story for another day. Point that I'm making is that there's almost a malice in some circles towards any expenditure by the EFF, which seems to be of affluence, of comfort. I remember the one time when members of parliament were being sworn in. It was in 2019. EFF members of parliament. And they went and they got clothes at H&M. You know, members of parliament make a lot of money. They make 105000 a month before tax. And they went to H&M and they got clothes, some of them at H&M. And they had a party at an Airbnb or something that they had booked. It's a big day. Can you imagine becoming a member of parliament? One out of 400 people been chosen. They had a party. 
And then there were complaints about the EFF throwing this, you know, living lavish and having this party. One of the journalists from a publication went to the trash of that Airbnb or whatever it was where the EFF members were staying and proudly showed us, look at what the EFF is drinking. Look at what they're drinking this drink. You know, if you buy some of these so-called expensive drinks from Tops, it, they're not as expensive as they are at a club because the clubs are overcharging. That's part of the reason you don't you won't see me in the club because I ain't got no club money. I will buy a bottle from Tops, but I won't buy it from the club. <laughs> My point is, that to me was very malicious. It was H&M is not flamboyant. It's not affluent. It's it's affordable for a minister and for many people in the middle class and even people who are not in the middle class, if you save, you can go buy some H&M pieces there. <laughs> anyway, I think there's there's a malice towards some of these questions that's not genuine, that's not about representation, that's not about ideology, that's not about any of these things. Finally, I want to say that you can be from a rich background and help the poor. You can be from a middle-class background and help the poor. And you can be from a poor background and help the poor. The idea that only those who stay poor or are poor can help the poor, I think is not genuine. I think we must measure always intent, action, and consistency. And that will really tell us. So do I care about whether or not any politician wears Gucci or Armani or whatever the case may be. No, not particularly. I am concerned, though, only in the context where these lavish lifestyles are being flashed in the face of the public. At times when the public is is going through very difficult times, I do think that there's something about it which is insensitive. Aside from that, I think most of this conversation is laced with that ra 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 word. The ra ra. They are ra 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 ra. You know what they are. Kendrick would say they're not like us. It's ra 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 That word, that one. That's what they're doing. A lot of this is that. They just don't want to see people who look like me and you have iPhones, have nice shoes have any affluent life because there's almost an idea or a thought that we don't deserve nice things. Then the question is, why not? Why do we not deserve nice things? What did we do that keeps us out of nice things? So who must go to Tasha's? Who must, who must eat these cakes? Who, who must buy these sneakers? Who must buy these shoes with the red bottoms? Who must go to Deben July? Is it is it not for us also? We can't. What do you guys think? Let's have a conversation. <laughs>